Hello everyone. Today I'm going to continuing my series of talks about meningiomas. A few days ago, that is last Thursday, uh, Ben and I were reading a series of sinus films and we saw this finding. Anybody except for Ben would like to venture a diagnosis? What could this possibly be? It was the first thing I talked about during my talk last week about meningiomas. It's an unusual location, but what could these be? Welcome, Nate. Nate mentioned a possibility, a malignant lesion. I don't want to go through a long differential of uh, skull lesions, but what about something benign? Correct. As Gino said, a venous lake or arachnoid granulation. So we found a prior study from 2011 showed the same lesions, just slightly smaller. And here's the diagnosis on an MR that was done in 2012 and showed a typical MR finding of arachnoid granulations. Now, if you look at this, uh, another beautiful diagram by an atomic diagram by Netter, we can see the tremendous amount of venous uh, lakes and uh, diploic veins all over the calvarium. And any place where you have these extensive network of veins on the, in the calvarium, you can have an arachnoid granulation that I talked about last week with the cap cells developing. So it's not unusual to have them in locations such as this as well. And uh, so it, it did get a little larger in the, la in the five years. So I asked Ben to see if he could find a paper that discusses possibly the enlargement of uh, arachnoid granulations and their effects on the skull. And Ben right away found an article uh, that showed also an unusual location for some of these arachnoid granulations in the posterior wall of the temporal bone. You can see it in three different cases. Here it is over here, and another case over here. Uh, and uh, you can see on the MR, the, again, the high signal on the T2 of the location of the arachnoid granulation. And that paper also said that these lesions can enlarge, especially in the temporal bone, and the clinician should be alerted in case the patient develops uh, you know, CSF leak or otorrhea or even meningitis, that these lesions can grow. Okay, let's move on. What is this lesion I'm showing? By the way, welcome to Nate from a long way. What is this lesion? Very good. The TZ resident came up with a diagnosis. Anybody else? Let me show another image. Anybody local? How about this image? 
I heard the word meningioma, which is correct. However, calcified was not the case. How about this last image? Does this help? Correct, fatty. What is this condition called? Correct. Whoever the guest is, is a lipoblastic, and this is a lipoblastic meningioma, and here's the specimen that was removed in this case. Meningiomas can have metaplastic features. Uh, more commonly is the lipoblastic, you can have osteoblastic, chondroblastic, myxoid, xanthomatous, and melanotic, uh, but this is a case of uh, lipoblastic. And here's a case that a former fellow, John, sent me. The patient came in for a stroke, as you can see here on the diffusion image, and we see this finding on the right side on the diffusion imaging. And here it is on the, I think on the T1, we can see the low, uh, the low density of this lesion. And, uh, and also notice there's a little bit of hypostosis here involving the calvarium. So this is another example of a incidental lipoblastic meningioma. And here's another case from the literature, very massive uh, lesion of a lipoblastic meningioma. This was the last case from the literature, again showing the very large lipoblastic meningioma. You can see here the, uh, the, the signal there because of the shift between the fat and the water. So, lipoblastic meningioma. And here's a case that I'll get into later that we had showing a little bit of fat here at the edge of this lesion, and uh, I will discuss it further on later. And here's a large calcified meningioma, but there was still a little bit fat within it, as you can see in this region of the bone windows. And, okay, what do we have here? Okay, as Ben says, hypostosis and Gino. This is uh, an intra and anshu. Everybody came up, and Veronica, and uh, everybody came up with the correct diagnosis. And, and I want to go th again through a long differential of bony lesions, which is part of a board review. But in the topic of today, this is an intraosseous meningioma. And you can see a little bit of the striations, which are typical of the bone formation. This is a case sent to me by former fellow Ramdas, very interesting case, a 32-year woman who presented with three months uh, with a lump on the head that she felt several months before. But she had no other symptoms and no significant history. And we can see already on the plain film that there's thickening of the calvarium here. And here are CT images showing the uh, the bone changes, the hypostosis, the irregularity of the calvarium, and following MR showed this thin layer here, and also the involvement of the calvarium. This would go along with the uh, unplugged meningioma, very thin layer. Uh, they were concerned about the abnormal uh, nuclear study showing the high uptake here in the same location. So again, this goes along with a, a very thin unplugged meningioma that I'll talk about later. And it's interesting that, that here's a case from the Nuclear Medicine Journal. Also, a woman had a modified radical mastectomy for invasive ductal carcinoma, and she had this lesion initially, and they decided just to follow it, and progressively, 
these are all studies done over several years, and you could see that this uh, lesion got larger, and eventually they operate on this, and this was a, again, a, a calvarial meningioma. So, again, you can have uh, two diseases. So, let, I'm going to start today with my showing various uh, features of meningiomas in various locations, and I'm going to start with convexity meningiomas. This is a famous diagram from Cushing, one of the fathers of uh, neurosurgery, uh, who wrote a classic book in the 1930s uh, showing various manifestations of meningiomas can do to calvarium. You can see progressive hypostosis and erosion of the skull. This was then modified later on uh, by Dr. Kreinbull and Yasagil showing skull findings which are basically normal, but also this uh, marked expansion beyond the calvarium, and I'll show an example of that later on. So this is kind of a classic diagram of the various manifestations of convexity meningiomas. And here's a standard incidental convexity meningioma. We can see the enhancement, the restricted diffusion, uh, and uh, just uh, the usual location of which there's a fair number we will see incidentally. And here's a, a classic, these are called globular meningiomas when they're round like that. So here's a large convexity meningioma uh, enhancing. This is from a, not the same patient, but specimen showing uh, at autopsy a very large uh, globular meningioma involving a convexity. And we can see on this uh, anatomic diagram here that there's really no involvement, so to speak, of the calvarium, uh, maybe a little dot here. And here it is on the sagittal view, meningioma and the non-contrast, following contrast, and again, here's the specimen to show what it would look like. What about this meningioma? This is a trick case. It's not really a meningioma. Anybody want to guess what this could be? Simulating a meningioma? Matt, not a bad idea. Everybody says Matt. Correct. Some semi-correct. This was a lymphoma. Okay. Here's a case that Jim gave me and this was a metastatic lesion, I cannot show the bone windows that show the erosion. This was a met from a lung tumor. Uh, so they simulate meningiomas. And here was an interesting case, incidental finding of a 14-year-old came with headaches and had this lesion here, as you can see on the various imaging, and weren't too sure what this was, uh, low signal, and turned out uh, that this was an unusual venous anomaly you can see on the MRV. Uh, so there was no, re it was incidental, but you can see on the M MRV here that these were all just uh, like venous channels that uh, created this uh, abnormal low signal on the MR. Now, here's another convexity meningioma. What is the arrow pointing to? The arrow is pointing to to where the meningioma started. There's a little bit of, as you can see on this CT, a little bit of calcification. 
it's very important to figure out where the meningioma started. So if you look at here at this anatomic diagram, this is where the meningioma started, and then gradually as it enlarges, it expands from this nidus. So when we see this little calcification, this is where the meningioma started, and then expands from beyond that point, and we can see the hypostosis. Again, all the manifestation of a classic convexity meningioma. And again, here's a very large meningioma. We see a little bit of calcification within it. So again, diagrammatically, this is the location where it started. And again, we can see the calcification on the CT. And here's a progressively more involved complex meningioma. Again, a large convexity meningioma. Notice that the skull is much thicker here, has expanded uh, both on the CT scan, on the MR, and again, looks like this diagram where there's marked expansion of the, of the calvarium. And here's the case I was talking about. This was long time ago before CT and the patient presented. Here the patient is in surgery. You could see this massive extracalvarial mass. The plain film showed the marked erosion. Here's a, the view showing the massive expansion beyond the calvarium all this uh, sunburst appearance of the bone. Here's the lower diagrammatic representation of this mass. This was all outside the calvarium. So this is extracalvarial expansion of a massive uh, meningioma. And here's the bone from this after surgery showing the marked thickening of the calvarium. What about this case? A large extracalvarial meningioma. How about the new images I just put up? Is this still a meningioma? Please note that there are two lesions here. As Cecilia says, metastatic disease. Nate also said, could be METS. <coughs> Correct. This was a metastatic carcinoma of unknown primary and uh, very simulating a meningioma, except if you look here, this kind of undercutting would be extremely unusual for meningioma. And the skull really doesn't look that bad. Meningioma would just not undercut like that. It would, just, it would go right through. So this is, this is against the meningioma if you had a single lesion, although here we had two. Here's a case was followed for small menin convexity meningioma. This is a three months follow-up. Still a meningioma, or you want to think of something else? Of course, unlikely for any meningioma to grow so fast in three months. They never do that, even the highly malignant one. And this was a metastatic melanoma, again simulating a little meningioma uh, early on. What about this lesion? Intracalvarial and extracalvarial. Is this a meningioma? As Net Nate says, met. Why? Because of the what does the calvarium show? Notice in this anatomic diagram from Netter, we have a meningioma 
was intracranial, extracranial component. But look at the skull. Skull is expanded and destroyed. In this case, notice that the skull doesn't look expanded. As if anything, it looks narrowed. So that would be very, very unusual for meningioma. And this was, again, this was metastatic breast carcinoma, uh, simulating a little bit of a calvarium meningioma. But again, the appearance of the skull is against this being a meningioma. Here's another lesion. Is this a meningioma? By now you know I'm showing non-meningiomas. Any diagnoses so far? Somebody mentioned leukemia. Not. Let me show some more images. CT comes to the rescue. What is that? Very permeated, destructive type findings. Sarcoma, chondrosarcoma, possibly, but this was a epithelioid hemangioma. Okay, so this was just a, a hemangioendothelioma showing extensive destruction of the calvarium. So here, now let's move on. This is the unplugged meningioma. It's a very thin layer of meningioma. It looks a little larger on the axial here just because of the curvature of the skull. So this is what would be called an unplugged meningioma in, in distinction to a globular meningioma. Just a thin layer, relatively thin. And here's another unplugged meningioma, but in this case, there's also extensive involvement of the calvarium, as we can see on this uh, diagram from uh, Cushing and Eisenhardt's book. Again, unplugged meningioma, thin layer, and marked expansion of the overlying bone, which is also involved by the tumor. Okay, another unplugged lesion, but again, this is not a meningioma, simulating meningioma. So what could this possibly be? Let me show some more images. Anybody, any guesses what this pseudo unplugged meningioma is, is, is caused by? People mention osteosarcoma. You may, no, not that. Anything else? More images. Anybody see any abnormalities here besides the lesion itself? Somebody mentioned fibrous dysplasia. N not was not the case here. Involvement of the orbit. Somebody mentioned leukemia. Anything else? Here are the calvarial lesions involving again little mass in the orbit. This was metastatic prostate carcinoma. Okay, remember, although we rarely see that. But usually, when you have a, a dural, peridural involvement, prostate is in a differential diagnosis. Here's another from the literature, a large unplugged type lesion, prostate mets. Here's another simulating unplugged meningioma. This was pachymeningitis, severe uh, involvement against simulating an unplugged meningioma. Another disease, anybody what this could be? 
none of the things we mentioned so far correct I think that Nate mentioned that earlier for the other lesion this was sarcoid okay neurosarcoidosis again simulating an unplugged meningioma okay let's move on to some interesting angiographic uh, changes so here's here's a case from the old days showing on the plain films thickening of the calvarium increased channels here and if we look at the angiogram here we can see an enlarged middle meningeal artery and then we see a little bit of a stain and this was really a classic sign for convexity meningioma and one of the key features was always that the middle meningeal artery as it was getting closer to the lesion was enlarging and uh, looks larger and that's because it was recruiting you know blood supply from from the surrounding area so the branch feeding the tumor was always slightly larger so that was like a classic sign so again uh, here's the hypostosis uh, of the meningioma so if we look at a different case of an angiogram again here's the enlarged branch of the middle meningeal artery supplying this lesion and we see the, the stain and I want to get to this this is a classic what's called a sunburst sign and a spoke wheel pattern that's what uh, it refers to and we see the middle meningeal artery markedly enlarged branch here and then you see all these radiating uh, images uh, vessels coming out the so-called sunburst sign so the tumor started here and gradually has expanded the branches form this very classic pattern and here it is again this is the first diagram that I showed that I could not find the where I where I found that many many years ago I've been looking all over and if anybody sees that please let me know where it came from but this is like a classic picture from 40 50 60 years ago showing the middle meningeal artery here coming here this is where the tumor started and then all these radiating sunburst type or oh, spoke wheel pattern and then on the periphery when the lesion let, gets large enough the peel vessel will supply the outer part of the tumor so the center is supplied by the middle meningeal the outer part by the uh, convexity peel branches and here's a a new version of this diagram in stat dx showing the same issue so here's the middle meningeal artery coming this is where the tumor started and gradually as it got larger we see this in red the middle meningeal branches and then when the lesion get, gets large enough it'll start get, being supplied by peel vessels and here's an angiogram I did many years ago showing the dual supply of a large meningioma so here's a selective injection of the uh, external carotid with a large middle meningeal and later on we see the stain here then I did an internal carotid injection and uh, which is uh, the middle cerebral is displaced medially and we see the stain so there are two parts to the stain the part supplied by the middle meningeal and the part supplied by the internal carotid and the same principle holds this was a large tentorial meningioma you have very prominent uh, prominent tentorial arteries coming off the carotid uh, and you can see the markedly enlarged that supplies part of the tumor and then other parts are supplied by branches of the posterior cerebral uh, which as the lesion gets much larger starts supplying the lesion so a dual supply to meningiomas here's a nice example from uh, Osborne's book again the middle meningeal supply centrally uh, 
and the stain by the internal carotid. Again, the dual supply. Now, why spend time nowadays talking about this when we have MR and we don't have to deal with all these angiographic changes? The reason is that we can see the same thing on MR. Again, this beautiful image here, here's an MR showing a massive meningioma, again, the same pattern diagrammatically represented here. Here's the nizus with a little bit of endostosis. This is where the tumor started. And here are all these radiating um, middle meningeal branches and then the periphery supplied by PL vascularity. So just exactly like this. And here's a case we had, not as pretty as the diagram, but again, here's a large frontal meningioma. Here's the nidus. This is where the tumor started. And notice these are all the radiating middle meningeal branches that we can pick up on the, on, on the flare imaging. And we can even see these radiating branches branches on the post uh, contrast image. So here again. So these are the branches which are very useful to diagnose. Just another sign that this is a meningioma. The same thing can also be seen, I'll talk about it later on, that here, here's a meningioma of the flow of the anterior fossa. And again, we can see, this is where the tumor started. This is uh, the anterior meningeal artery branches again, coming out from the nidus or where the tumor started, and we can identify them on MR. Different case of uh, olfactory groove meningioma. Again, notice here the meningeal branches coming to supply the lesion. And here, going back to this case, so this is a partially lipoblastic meningioma. So this is all the fat already being converted or, or within this meningioma I showed you was markedly calcified. I did a subtraction, and again, we can see these radiating branches here coming out from the, uh, from the calvarium to supply the lesion. So again, partly fat, and we can also see the vascularity on the subtraction. And here's a fantastically beautiful case that I found just a few days ago on the intranet showing, again, all these features. So here's, this was a, actually, the middle meningeal was coming off from the ophthalmic artery. Look how, mar how large it is. Uh, and look at this beautiful sunburst or spoke wheel pattern, all the middle meningeal branches so coming off from the from the nidus, and they did a CTA, and again showing the displacement of the middle cerebral branches, and note all these radiating branches and the hypostosis, a classic appearance on a CTA, or what I was talking about, of the sunburst sign for meningioma. Okay, let's move on. Next group is parasagal meningiomas. A large group of uh, meningiomas, which also include Fox meningiomas. Now, what is the difference between a convexity and a parasagal meningioma? Cushing already uh, made the distinction. A convexity meningioma should not approach the superior sagittal sinus. Once the tumor, like this one, abuts or approaches the uh, superior sagittal sinus, it then turns what they, is called a parasagittal meningioma. And if we look at this diagram, so this is a convexive meningioma. They drew a piece of the brain here between the meningioma and the superior sagittal sinus. This is a false meningioma coming off the false. This is a parasagittal where the lesion abuts on the superior sagittal sinus. So the, this is a parasagittal meningioma. Parasagittal meningioma, which involved the, the superior sagittal sinus, uh, 
many times are most common in the center about uh, the middle third of the superior sagittal sinus and anteriorly much less and posteriorly. The further back the meningioma is, the more serious the consequences are as far as if there's occlusion of the superior sagittal sinus. So again, here's a parasagal meningioma abutting on the superior sagittal sinus. This is where the lesion started. Notice again uh, a low signal area in the uh, lesion itself. And again, calcification confirming that this is a meningioma. And here's another lesion, a parasagal meningioma. Notice it's a budding on the sinus. And again, CT confirms that this is a meningioma. Now, why am I focusing so much on CT? Because 75% of said last week of meningiomas uh, are cal show calcifications on CT which helps make the diagnosis. Now, let me digress from meningiomas for a minute. So, here's a, a, this is close as I could find, two lesions, these are like Falk's lesions. So here's one, here's the other one. Don't look exactly the same. Here's, here's I didn't, I could not find a CT, but luckily a CTA was done shows calcification, this MR, the CT, I'm sorry, shows no calcification. So this was a Fox meningioma, this was a metastatic lesion. This was met from the lung, and this was a meningioma. It's extremely important, if in doubt, try to get a CT, quick study, and you'll get the answer if you see calcification. And here's what I want to digress. This case was read, this patient was a, had the primary tumor. This was read as a metastatic focus. And the fellow came to show me this case because the fellow was a little concerned with the reading. I said, let's find a CT. Sure enough, here's the CT on this patient that the people didn't bother looking, had a little bit of calcification, this is an incidental uh, tiny meningioma in the posterior fossa. Had nothing to do with being a met. Made a big difference to the patient. Here's a patient who had the tumor, I think it was in his chest, had this lesion here. Overnight at the time, a fellow was covering and he told the clinician that there was metastatic drop mets in the spine. This didn't look particularly like a drop met. I said, let's look for a CT. Found an abdominal CT. Here's a lesion, calcified lesion. This is a, likely a interspinal meningioma, tiny meningioma. Another case. Patient has metastatic uterine CA. This was read as a metastatic drop met or um, intraspinal metastases. I said, let's look for CT. CT showed, again, a lesion. People did not accept that because this was a post-contrast scan. They said, oh, this could be a met that is enhancing. A few, uh, few days later, another CT was done, and non-contrast shows the lesion. So again, this was a mini incidental meningioma, not a metastatic disease. So I just want to uh, emphasize the importance for checking for calcifications uh, to help in differentiating meningiomas from other lesions. Okay, let's get back to parasagal meningiomas. 
this kind of beautiful diagram by Netter, I've, it's very hard to see this type of a finding of a little bit too, too much protruding into the sinus. Here, here's a parasagal meningioma showing some deformity of the superior sagittal sinus, which is still open. Here's a very tiny meningioma, again show, showing a partial invasion of the sinus. You can see still the sinus partially open, simulating this, uh, like this diagram. Here's another case of a small meningioma, again showing partially involving the superior sagittal sinus. Here was another meningioma that actually invaded the superior sagittal sinus. Very unusual to see it like that. Uh, you see the signal within the sinus, <clears throat> and the MRV showed that there's a loss of the normal signal, and notice on the coronal 2D, you can see the deformed uh, superior sagittal sinus because it was partially filled by the tumor. And here's a very tiny meningioma which was actually sitting within the superior sagittal sinus and at the level where the lesion was you can see loss of the flow signal. So here's a normal caliber of the sinus. This is reduced here because of tumor sitting within it. Let's talk about Falk's meningiomas. So here are two patients. This patient has an incidental Falk's meningioma on the left side. This one, the meningioma is Falk's meningioma on the right side. Again, incidental findings. Here's a much larger Falk's meningioma. This is not the same patient, but showing again uh, what they would look like when they get larger. Here's a meningioma which likely started on this side and then went through the fox to the other side, kind of has a bilobed appearance. Here's a fox meningioma hanging down from the inferior edge of the fox. Here's a larger Fox meningioma hanging down from the inferior part of the Fox, already causing some uh, compression of the brain. And they can get larger. Look at this massive falsy meningioma, totally deforming the corpus callosum, compressing and deforming the ventricular system. Here it is on the axial view. And here's a, a huge frontal meningioma. So the question when you look at this, is this, could this be a meningioma arising from the floor of the anterior fossa? But here again, well, we have to pay attention to this calcification. Remember, this is the nidus. This is where the lesion started. So this would be unlikely to be a cribriform plate meningioma because the calcification wouldn't be that high. So this is, again, a large Fox meningioma that has actually now come all the way down to the floor of the anterior fossa. And they get bigger and bigger. Here's a massive falcine meningioma all the way now uh, expanding laterally, but still uh, started at the at the junction of the tentorium uh, and the and the fox. And I showed this image last time because this was a benign. This was again a massive enlarged falsy meningioma. Uh, again, you see it's kind of budding on the tentorium but unlikely for tentorium meningioma to go all the way up here. Here it invaded to the other side, 
again, a massive meningioma, again, originating from the fox. What about this meningioma? Is this benign or malignant? Hard to tell. As I've said last week, you cannot really tell by looking what could be either, correct. However, there's a third possibility. So the two possibilities, benign, malignant meningioma, what is the third possibility? This was a malignant glioma with the, at the medial M aspect of the hemisphere simulating a meningioma. So we have to think of other possibilities because uh, it makes a difference in the approach also. But can't be sure sometimes. But this was a glioma. What about this fox meningioma? Not a meningioma, however. What could it be? Again, we're now talking about lesions simulating meningiomas, in this case, fox meningiomas. Any guesses? Does this help? Same patient. Correct. As Asif said, this is neuropsychoidosis, okay? Simulating a meningioma, but here we have skull base in involvement, neurosarcoid. How about this case? Another Fox menin meningioma simulator. Lymphoma, not a bad possibility, however, this was, again, prostate adenocarcinoma simulating a Fox meningioma. How about this case? A, a classic false meningioma, but it was not. Any other lesion which rare in this country? Central neurocytomas, it, that's a good diagnosis, but it was not that. That should really be lower down within the ventricle. This is above the ventricle. It's not involving the septum. It's kind of hanging down from the fox. Any other choices? Somebody mentioned GBM. That's true, lymphomas could also look like that, but none of those. This was a tuberculoma. Very unusual, as I said, in this country. How about this lesion? Again, looks like a Fox meningioma, but this again, another tuberculoma. How about this massive, looking like a massive false meningioma? What was this? Something we haven't mentioned before? Not a GBM, was not. Does this help? Something way out of our thinking. 
extramedullary hematopoiesis, not, not high or not differential, but nevertheless, this is what this was. Here's another example from the literature, unusual looking lesion. This again was extramedullary hematopoiesis. This, this was a, a calcified hemorrhagic epidermoid cyst. It was actually, this was all blood. Again, I'm just showing that because it was very unusual. Uh, again, kind of either side of the fogs in the anterior fossa. Here's an interesting case. This was followed as a small meningioma. Patient came back about, I don't know, a year or two later. Does this look like a meningioma? Not really. It's gotten larger, it has cysts now. Next follow up, even larger. Patient had a history many, many years ago of a craniopharyngioma removal. I've never heard of craniopharyngiomas metastasizing, but I looked up in the literature, and sure enough, here's a paper from Adrian Art showing a patient that had a craniopharyngioma, and many years later had metastatic lesions. Uh, and look at the similarity, this kind of cystic appearance, similar to this case. Don't have any proof, but likely these could be metastatic lesions from a craniopharyngioma. Definitely does not look like any meningioma uh, that we would think of uh, the variations. And this is the last case I want to show. This is a five-month-old that came in uh, uh, because of, I think, bulging fontanelles. Nothing abnormal was found, but what is this structure here? There was a follow-up study. This was a haste showed this. What is this structure at the inferior edge of the fox? Anybody? Is this a tumor? A vascular structure? Correct. Uh, Somebody mentioned the venous varix. That's getting close. Here it is on the MRV. So it's not, it wasn't one month old, five months old. Here it is on the axial MRV. Notice you don't see anything on the arterial, uh, on the MRA, except uh, this was on the contrast study, and this is the MRV. This is what's called a persistent falsine sinus that Dr. Bronin, I mean, I read this, uh, and uh, this is, this is a, and a, this, this has been described in the literature uh, What happens is that do early in field development, there's a large venous channel 
they're all kind of venous, venous channels uh, in the region of the inferior sagittal sinus that usually close off during embryonic life. But sometimes they may be persistent and stay postnatally. Most of the time they're associated with uh, all kind of abnormalities, cor corpus callosum abnormalities, other brain ab abnormalities, but sometimes you may see them incidentally, like in this case, where they're just persistent of the falsing sinus, this venous uh, channel that eventually, uh, and may, and may uh, be associated with uh, an anomalies of the straight sinus. So for instance, here's this paper in AJNR showing this it actually two persistent uh, falsing sinuses. Notice there's like a very atratic or thin straight sinus. Uh, this is like the normal. Here there's no straight sinus whatsoever. There's just the drainage tr is through these falsing sinuses. And here there's another paper showing prominent falsing sinuses with absence of the straight sinus. So again, in this case, this was not a lesion, it was just persistent of the falsing sinus, uh, and you can see in the region of the inferior sagittal sinus. Also, the, the vein of Galen looked a little bit prominent, and I think also that the straight sinus may be a little thinned here. This is just a, a venous anomaly. And this is the last image I'm showing today. Thank you for your attention.